Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to Semaphore Uncut, a podcast for developers about building great products. In this new episode, Darko the podcast host welcomes Stack Overflow and Discourse co-founder Jeff Atwood. Jeff reveals his thoughts on the platforms that have left an indelible mark on the programming community. We delve into his achievements, reflections, and perspective on communities, the role of AI, and the future of programming. I hope you enjoy this new episode. Now let's dive in. Hello, everyone. Today with us, we have Jeff Atwood. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, you're welcome. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Can you please just go ahead and introduce yourself? I'm a long-term programmer. I've been a programmer for 30 years. I uh, started a blog in 2004 called Coding Horror that became very popular. And I was trying to decide what to do with all the energy in my blog. And Joel Spolsky replied to me, another famous programmer at a blog that I respect deeply. And he came to us with this idea, which became Stack Overflow. I left Stack Overflow in 2012, and then started Discourse, which was a kind of a continuation of Stack Overflow. The way I explain it to people is Stack Overflow is really a classroom. It's a place you go to learn stuff. And it's strict in some senses. Like you can't just go to school and just have fun. You have to learn. Discourse is more loose. It's more like, well, I just want a bunch of people together and we're going to do some things. I'm trying to build places where people can come online together and not just tear each other apart. We have recently launched a CICD learning tool which shortcuts into everything you need to know to level up your CICD process and increase your productivity. Also, to ensure that all our customers get the best CICD guidance, we have improved our sign-up process. From now on, everyone who's considering using Semaphore will get personalized CICD expert guidance from day one. Our engineers have more than 10 years of experience, so you'll surely be in good hands. Check it out on our website, semaphoreci.com. If you would be starting uh, Stack Overflow today in terms of that community and control and uh, with these bags examples that you were just mentioning, would you structure it in a different way? Would it be perhaps, you know, more more open or maybe even open source? Or how would you treat that? Would it still be a company or would it be some foundation, something else? I mean, just curious. I think we got... A lot of things right with Stack Overflow, and I say that in the sense that we actually listen to the community. Like, that was my primary job. And when you listen to the community, you got to realize it's difficult. It's hard work. The community feedback, you have to sift through this river. You're, like, panning for gold of, like, okay, you're getting a lot of feedback that's just, you know, weird, not actionable. We can't do this right now. That would be massive amounts of work. I can't rewrite my entire product. But 10% of the time, the feedback you get will be solid gold. It's stuff where you're like, oh my God, that's such a good idea. I wish we had done this three years ago. And that's where the magic happens, is listening to your community and folding in the best parts of their feedback and improving the product for them. As far as what I would do differently, I don't think we made too many mistakes because we did a pretty good job of listening to the community and also when they push back because people will fight you on this stuff. And sometimes they're right. You know, they're fighting because like, this is a bad feature. This is really hurting us or we're not getting what we need. And you have to be able to listen to that and hear it. It's hard work. And some people just don't want to do the work. They just want to have that dictator model. Nope, I'm just going to build the product, eat it. This is what you get. And if you don't like it, then you can respectfully leave. Stack Overflow was always designed for practicing expert programmers. People either already had a job as a programmer or could easily get a job as a programmer. What it didn't cover at all was people who were beginners, who were trying to learn to program from first principles. And there was a lot of friction in the system where people didn't really understand this. And we didn't, to be fair, we didn't do a great job of explaining this to people that, you know, we assumed you kind of knew what you were doing already. And I think if I had to do it over again, there would be two sites, one for the people who are already practicing programmers and another site for the beginners who are like, I want to learn programming. And it, it would pair you with someone else and it would be very interactive, very real time and less structured. You know, having a sandbox to play in, like a, a spinning up, you know, a VM and saying, okay, let's code together now and I'll teach you how to do this, all that stuff. I think that was the primary, I don't call it a mistake, but like if you really want to address the complete audience of programmers, it's the people who are already programmers or could get a job as programmers. And then the people that are like, wow, I really want to be a programmer. And those people have a very bad time on Stack Overflow because it's not for them. It was never designed for those people. Replit is doing a more than decent job with that. There is. Yeah. No, I think it's fantastic. I think it's amazing. Like, you know, the whole real time aspect of, you know, everything in the browser. I'm a huge fan of everything in the browser. So a topic that I want to cover and uh, let me explain maybe how do I, f- I feel about 
about it uh, currently is that all of us we're working on like a nice meadow that we know and uh, is predictable and I feel that we are all kind of entering a jungle with this AI and chat GPT, you know, and all of those other movements in this area. And uh, I mean, just last weekend, there is an area of semaphore, which we always wanted to improve significantly about various metrics, you know, and uh, insights that we have, but we didn't have time to develop that. So I was I started chatting with ChatGPT and like in 45 minutes, I got somewhere where on my own, I would probably need, I don't know, a full working week at least to get there. And by the end of the conversation, I started asking, okay, give me a code that implements that formula or, you know, uh, SQL query and so on. It, it just ended up, you know, throwing stuff at me. So I'm really curious, how do you see this period that is in front of us when it comes to development and coding and where we are going? Uh, well, I think there's an element of repetition. Like one of the ongoing jokes on Stack Overflow, and they actually introduced a real keyboard. It was Control C, Control V. There's like this little keyboard that had the, you know, Control copy paste, because the joke was you were never really coding, you would just Google it and then copy and paste the code. And if you think about it through that lens, this whole thing of AI being magical, it's like, well, there's just too much repetitive activity in coding. There's too many people writing the same code over and over. And Bill Gates once famously said, and this is still deeply true. He's like, why the hell is everybody writing a file open dialogue over and over? There should be one file open dialogue provided by the system and we can all use it. There is absolutely no point to 100 developers building their own file open dialogue. And you can make that same logical argument about a lot of code in the world. That, And I've espoused for a long time that what's the best code? What is the best code you can write? And the answer is no code. Zero code is the best code because every line of code is code that has to be debugged, troubleshot, maintained, source controlled. Code is the enemy. Code is not your friend. Your job as a coder is not, I mean, we can make a drug joke here. You're doing lines of code. You're like, yeah, I get to write more code. Well, you're just getting high on your own supply. Get off the lines of code, man. That's not a metric. Like the whole metric of, you know, I wrote so many lines of code today. That makes me a great developer. It's like, no, that makes you a bad developer. Only write code that you have to absolutely write. You know what I mean? At the highest level of abstraction that you can. Like you don't want to write machine code. You want to write as high level as possible and as little as possible. So through that lens, all this AI stuff are like, oh, wow, it, it magically produced a solution for me. You know why it produced a solution for you? Because like a hundred other people wrote the same stupid ass code. This is not useful code. It's repetitive, dumb code that we need to eliminate from the world. You know, nobody should be writing this code. If it was really interesting code, you wouldn't be able to synthesize it that way because it would be unique. It would be specific to your problem and maybe a new approach that no one's tried before, right? Otherwise, it's just be part of a standard library that we all use, you know? It's a built-in function that we call uh, built into the operating system, built into the browser, built into your phone. Nobody should be writing this. There should be less programmers, not more. Building things, that's the important part. Writing code is just a way of building things, right? The important thing is that you build something, not I wrote 50 lines of Perl. You know, that's not something to be proud of. What's something to be proud of is that you ship this amazing tool that helps people. Yeah, and uh, what would you say for the people that are in the, in the beginning of their careers, maybe just got their job like five months ago? I assume they should just embrace you know, generating the code and just sail the ship in that, let's call it like a, a new way on boosters? Or would you, someone who is at the beginning of their career, advise maybe some alternative? I think it's kind of a combination of both. I think when you're starting out, you do need to learn principles, like how do things work? Why do they work? Not at the machine level, getting into, again, machine code. Like I don't, I think that's inflicting pain on people, frankly. Within that, you do need to understand like many of the computer science fundamentals, like, you know, how are numbers represented, a big Indian, little Indian, how do for loops work? How does logic work? Coding conventions, source control, a lot of the big picture stuff, as well as some of the low level concepts. I think as a new programmer, you do want to write some repetitive code because you're practicing. And if you go to any school curriculum, well, there's all these kids doing math and it's not like it's unique math, right? It's like simple math problems that everybody's done a billion times, but you still need to do it to learn the fundamentals. Fundamentals. So there's kind of some differences here when you're starting out versus when you're, again, this dichotomy of when you're a beginner, you need different things than when you're a professional and practicing programmer. You need different things. 
So one of those differences as a beginner would be, yeah, you're going to be writing some repetitive code that a lot of people have written. And I think leaning on the AI, AI there to generate it would be kind of a negative because you're just getting this block of code that does magic and you need to actually understand that block of code. Like what if it has a bug? What if it's not doing what you want it to do? So you need to kind of break it down and understand it as a beginner. So that's my take. We have recently launched a CICD learning tool with shortcuts into everything you need to know to level up your CICD process and increase your productivity. Also, to ensure that all our customers get the best CICD guidance, we have improved our signup process. From now on, everyone who's considering using Semaphore will get personalized CICD expert guidance from day one. Our engineers have more than 10 years of experience, so you'll surely be in good hands. Check it out on our website, semaphoreci.com. There is a number of websites, Stack Overflow being one of them, actually starting to or planning to start to charge for the just open AI or other language models, you know, ingesting all that information. What's your take on generally open AI or any other model just ingesting all the world's information in a way and then presenting it to the people and becoming uh, almost like an interface? to the Stack Overflow or any other repository of information? Well, let me answer this through the Stack Overflow lens because when we started Stack Overflow, Joel and I intentionally licensed everything under Creative Commons. The whole point was the people contributing effort in the system deserve the right to that content. They created it. So for the AIs to come in and, and scrape Stack Overflow is actually part of the design. The whole point is you're sharing the content. And bigger picture, does this tool help people? Okay, maybe people don't click through to Stack Overflow and that hurts Stack Overflow, but I'm thinking bigger picture, what helps the world? And I think if you look at Stack Overflow and you see that, oh, that is Stack Overflow's goal, it actually wants to help the world, people will respect you and they will stay on the site because they understand this is the source. Without Stack Overflow, you would have nothing. You would not have this tool if not for Stack Overflow and all the people that contribute all this effort and work. And we respect the rights of those people. We even hold moderator elections. No other website in the entire world that I know of does this. You can go to Stack Overflow, get enough reputation, participate in a democratic election and be elected a moderator on Stack Overflow or any of the Stack Exchange sites. No one else does this. And I wish we got more credit for this because like I said, I think this concept of democracy is so critically important to this as we move from an analog world to an increasingly rapidly digital world. We need democracy. I'm fine with the AIs, you know, scraping Stack Overflow content. It's Creative Commons. Now, I think Creative Commons needs to reconcile attribution, right? So when the AIs are pulling content, it's like, well, where did this content come from? What was the source of this content? When an AI comes back and says, blah, 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 you don't really know where it came from. And that's not right because you should be able to say, oh, this is actually wrong. You gave me an incorrect solution. And I know why, because your sources were wrong or you used incorrect sources. You're not providing that information to the user or to the world. And there's no opportunity to click through to the original source and actually learn more. And that's not right. And it's, I think it has to be attacked at the creative commons level. There needs to be probably, I, I think you're gonna see really rapidly a new creative commons license. Now, the one we use at Stack Overflow does require attribution, meaning you're free to copy Stack Overflow content and use it and remix it and all that stuff, but you must link back to us because we deserve that as users. This is our content. You must cite us and say, this is where I got this, and you, but you can use it. And what's your hunch based on the decades in the industry? How easy it would be to push the now essentially Microsoft towards doing that? Would that be something from the regulation that would need to, you know, step in to do that or, or the... When your AI scrapes us and then produces an answer using our content, you're not attributing us. And that is a violation of the Creative Commons license. That's the primary fulcrum point, the way I see it. You know, just like GPL, right? Another license. It's like, well, there's rules with the license. You can use the code, but you got to follow the license. This is a legal matter. You recently stepped down as a CEO of this course. What's next for you? Uh, well, you know, we took a, my family and I tri took a trip to Washington, D.C., and it was incredibly inspiring. Like the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, you know, of the people, by the people, for the people. And I was like, oh my God, of the programmers, by the programmers, for the programmers. 
I was like, this was Stack Overflow. I didn't even understand what I was building, but I really was trying to build this form of democracy on the web. And it's hard, it's sloppy, it's messy. It's a lot cleaner to just be a dictator and just tell people what to do. But like, eventually your users are going to abandon you because why would you want to live somewhere where you have no say in what happens and a bunch of people, just, you have no freedom. And it was a profound insight for me. And discourse is the same way. It's about empowering communities. As The more you participate, the more abilities you get. So as far as what's coming next, I think for me, it's realizing we're transitioning from analog to digital world, like very rapidly, much more rapidly than I thought. Like it's a little scary actually how rapidly it's happening. We need to carry across these principles that we learned and are still trying to live up to hundreds of years later. Like, do we have perfect equality? Are all people created equal in the United States? I mean, it's better. It's better. But we're still getting there. That's how hard the job is. You're going to spend hundreds of years trying to live up to these ideals. But that's how important they are. They're worth dying for. Because we can't survive. And I know I'm very dramatic and I apologize. We cannot survive as a species unless we learn to do this and work together and build things. Just for president. <laughs> no, please, God. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I appreciate the sentiment, but oh, hell no. Like, no. Your story about now understand more deeply about how Stack Overflow is structured and what you invested and made sure that it lives on on the same principles because it's not as, as you were pointing out on multiple occasions like a dictator. And then, you know, what's the succession planning? What will be the behavior of that next person? But there is a culture, I would say, that is put into place. So is it now Jeff? steering the ship or it's someone else, there is a culture that will make sure that it continues to sail in the right direction. And uh, with your, your vast experience in online community building, I think this is a, a really profound thing that people can get from this, from this episode. Well, thank you very much. And when I stepped down as CEO, it was all about, and again, I apologize, I, I'm not comparing myself to George Washington because that's really a lot. But George Washington, right, was the first president and he intentionally stepped down because he said, look, this is not going to be a monarchy and I'm going to show you because I will gently release power back to and have elections and we'll pick another president. And I think when I stepped down in Stack Overflow, well, first I was very burned out, but also like I intuitively realized like, okay, this is kind of how it has to be. But with discourse, it was a little more intentional. I was like, look, my co-founders, Sam, uh, Robin sort of retired, his mother co-founder and Hawk, I was like, I want to hand over power to you because I want to lift you up, because that's how discourse works. It's all about empowering the community, empowering other people to grow and step into larger roles. You have to step down at a certain point for a variety of reasons. It's the correct, morally correct and right thing to do. Yeah, I would like to encourage you to write the book on community building and all these <laughs> principles and uh, this going from, from analog to digital, because it is something that will, you know, be the basis of civilization going forward. It will be. That's, that's the scary part. It's, it's happening and like way faster than I thought it would. Great. Jeff, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. No, oh, you're welcome. I, I hope this was useful to people. And just uh, if you are curious, obviously people know Stack Overflow, but check us out at discourse.org and see what we're building and give us feedback because we want to make it better for everyone. What a great conversation. We hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Make sure to subscribe to Semaphore Uncut on your podcast player of choice so that you don't miss our new episodes. And stay tuned. 